Hello and welcome to Moments of Musical Revelation, the podcast from the Aspen Music Festival and School. I'm your host, James Inverne, and our guest today is the wonderful violinist Simone Porter, who you just heard there. Simone was playing Prokofiev's Violin Concerto No. 1 in D major with the Aspen Chamber Symphony conducted by Nicholas McGeegan, and that was from the 2019 Aspen Music Festival, and you'll hear a bit more of that at the end of this programme. Simone is very much one of the Aspen family, an Aspen graduate. You might even say she was an Aspen baby, since she's been going to Aspen for every one of the last 10 years, and she's still a young musician. She, at a very early stage, opened the season for Aspen, and soon afterwards was taken up by the Los Angeles Philharmonic, where she's now played several times under Gustavo Dudamel and others. She has also played with the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and with other wonderful conductors, including Yannick Neze Sagan, Stefan Denev, Nicholas McGeegan, and Donald Runnicles. And we are delighted to have Simone Porter with us now. Simone Porter, lovely to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Now, we were chatting a bit just now, and I said to you when I heard what your chosen moment of musical revelation is going to be, that I thought I was the geekiest kid who ever <laughs> wore short trousers. But it turns out that there are, <laughs> there are people who are, who are even geekier than I, and a lot of them congregate in Aspen. So why don't you tell us what this thing is called a sight reading party? Yes. Uh, well, this is something that absolutely does exist in the dorky under depths of classical musicianship, I think. <laughs> and it was something I discovered for the first time when I went to Aspen. Uh, my first summer at Aspen was 13 years ago when I was 10 years old. And I quickly amassed a group of friends who were all sort of the young ones of Aspen, um, who were all around my age and were sort of outside the festival a little bit on the fringe because of our youth. And one of the things we would do is basically get together, check out a bunch of chamber music or duets or whatever from the library and just read it through together. And to me, that was an absolute revelation. Going to Aspen for the first time was life-changing, of course, because it exposed me to a caliber of musicianship, a breadth of knowledge, just a sheer amount of concerts um, were really stunning. But I think the way it affected me almost the most was becoming aware of how communal music making could be and that the bifurcation that existed in my head before I got there between playtime and work time didn't have to exist. I grew up in Seattle and I was not surrounded really that much with friends who were also really, really into music. I went to public school, had a pretty normal kid life for which I'm really grateful, but playing the violin and caring a lot about it was always something that sort of distinguished me or that I couldn't share. So let's focus on your first sight reading party. Was it at your place? Was it in someone else's room? No. <laughs> I went to this condo that a friend's family was renting in downtown Aspen, and I was friends with this family called the Sems family, and there were four daughters, all of whom played violin, and the younger two of whom were right my age. And I became like another sister, honestly. Um, I still consider them some among my closest friends, but that summer it was just an immediate click. And so we went to the library, just at the festival library, and I think we checked out a bunch of violin duets. And we basically just got together and playing violin and sight reading these things together blended with whatever else we were doing, eating ice cream, playing cards. It was all part of this experience of just getting to know each other and having a great time. So the librarian presumably had seen it all and was well used to people coming out and knew that these things went on. <laughs> I believe so, oh, yeah. <laughs> so do you remember what the first pieces were that you picked? I, I think it must have been... Bach double as the obvious choice, um, probably because everyone at that point, almost everyone has already played a part of it at some point. Um, and then we were really into these bar talk duos just because they're very easy enough to sight read even when you're 10. And they're also just short and fun and provide lots of moments for laughter. <laughs> 
And so the first sight reading party, was it quite small? Was it just you guys? And how big did these things get? Was there a, a sight reading party kind of circuit? Or did they, as you sort of acquired more friends there, did more people come along? Yeah, oh, they definitely got better. I think the first one I ever did was intimate. It was just a few of us um, experimenting. But certainly as the summer went on and the summers went on, since I do these all the time, the parties get bigger and bigger. You know, Mendelssohn Octet and Octets in general, I think are a sight reading party staple just because they can involve so many different people and you can switch between the movements. It's kind of perfect for that. But at that point, it was just a couple kid violinists. (laughs) (laughs) And how catered do these things get? I mean, do do you guys, I mean, you know, when you came to make them bigger, did you guys kind of properly prepare and go out and get food and uh, drinks and that kind of thing? Or was it really always very spontaneous, whatever's in the house is in the house and the music is the thing? Honestly, I've been to both. I think at that point, we had such loose schedules and we were hanging out every night no matter what so it could be spontaneous at this point in my life obviously everyone has an adult schedule so they are things that are planned and usually turn into you know wine and cheese and sight reading or something like that but at that point it was just whenever you feel like it violence out of the case you're playing around you mentioned that it played into your understanding or it altered perhaps your understanding of what it could be to be a musician and part of a musical community Yeah, I think, like I said, at that point, I loved playing violin so much, but the joy aspect felt very individual, I guess. I felt like there were these disparate parts of myself that aligned when I was on stage and when I was performing, but I had never felt that alignment so viscerally with other people. And something about the experience of just playing, of just uninhibited, unpressured joy with other young musicians really caused a switch in me. I think the fact that music and the attention we devote to each other on stage could be this communal and connective power is something that I try to tap into all the time on stage at this point, aligning with something beyond myself, whether it be other people, whether it be, you know, composer's attention, whether it be something more spiritual is what I think about all the time. And I really can trace the origins of that feeling back to the joy of experimenting and sort of letting the boundaries of myself go when just sight reading with um, good friends my first summer in Aspen. It's really interesting because musicians often talk about trying to approach all music as chamber music, even when it's a conductor conducting an orchestra, even sometimes when it's opera, but certainly when they're talking about concertos and so on. They often mean that it's to do with listening to each other and often it's to do with a sound. But this is interesting because this is almost kind of spinning it round that it's kind of chamber music as life. I mean, through chamber music, you discovered how to have that connection and that sense of community to other people. And then that played back into your life as a performer. Absolutely. I've been thinking about this a lot lately in terms of attention, actually. I was reading Simone Weil and I found this quote that was absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. And that sort of illuminated my entire understanding of, well, this very phenomenon of sort of alignment on stage. And it made me think about how playing chamber music and playing with people on stage can be something that is, you know, chamber music as life. The best onstage collaborations are when I think attention is distributed laterally and something about that allows us to generate inner sympathy with other people and the empathetic implications of that in real life are, I guess, exciting to me. (laughs) (laughs) But part of that presumably though is also sort of ironic and almost counterintuitive, but isn't part of that hyper attention, let's call it, learning to relax? Because it, it seems to me that if music making is about communication, then you have to be relaxed enough not to have any white noise interfering with that. Absolutely. That's actually really my sort of go-to trick or go-to place for getting over nerves on stage. I've noticed that the performances when I'm the most nervous and that are therefore 
kind of bad <laughs> happen when I enter this sort of solipsistic mindset. And when I'm nervous, I can only think about myself and what could go wrong. It's that sort of tension. So the way to get over that for me is always listening to whoever I'm playing with, really focusing all of my energy on the conductor, on the orchestra, on a pianist, on the group, whoever, but getting outside myself and focusing on really, really merging my sound, my playing, my phrasing with other people automatically distracts. And it's a space in which selfish nerves can't exist or can't work at their strongest. And none of that would have been possible without you in that sight reading party in Aspen all those years ago. And then more lately, the... (laughs) <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not on stage, but sight reading for sure. Um, but you know, when you think about sight reading, I think the two skills that it requires the most are pliability and humility. And those are also probably the most important traits when it comes to just playing with anybody on stage or, you know, playing with people, like you said, in life, in everyday interactions. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much. That's so fascinating. I think many listeners will now go and head straight for the wine bottle and the cheese board and um, grab some friends and some Bartok, which is obviously the way to go to a career such as yours. Um, (laughs) And Aspen is clearly the place to find that. And it's also the place to find Simone every year. This year, she was there playing Prokofiev with the wonderful Nicholas McGeegan, I'm sure, and hope we'll see you back there in 2020. I hope so. Thank you so much for speaking with me. That was violinist Simone Porter sharing with us her moment of musical revelation. Simone was at Aspen this year playing the Prokofiev First Violin Concerto with Nicholas McGee. This episode of Moments of Musical Revelation was produced in association with The Strad. Editing was by Tim Burton.